All right, good afternoon, everyone, and happy holidays. I am delighted to welcome you to our, I guess, last Leaders Initiative seminar um, of the year, um, where it's my um, honor and pleasure to welcome my colleague Esther Friedman to give a talk today. So um, those of you who are new to the series, there's um, a group of us kind of junior faculty who are part of the Leaders Initiative group through the Michigan Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. Um, and um, Courtney, who's on the call, has been kind of spearheading this effort to kind of alternate talks between some of our Leaders Initiative faculty with our invited guests. So as I said, I'm very honored and um, thrilled to welcome my invited guest today, Esther Friedman, who is a research associate professor at the Survey Research Center at the University of Michigan's Institute for Social Research, where she also serves as an associate director of the Panel Study of Income Dynamics. You may have heard this by its acronym PSID. Dr. Friedman is a sociologist whose research examines how families and communities facilitate the health and well-being of older adults, including those with dementia. She is currently the PI on an NIA R01, for which she is collecting and analyzing new data on the social support networks of family caregivers to persons with dementia. This is how Esther and I um, have connected through kind of our related caregiving networks work, so I'm excited to hear from her today. In addition to her substantive research, she holds leadership roles in several NIA-funded research centers and networks that facilitate collaboration across researchers, disciplines, and institutions. So um, we will have time at the end for questions, but you're welcome to also enter any questions in the chat and I'll be helping to monitor that. Um, but with that, I will uh, welcome Esther, thank you. Thank you, thank you for having me here. Uh, I'm gonna share my Slides. Let's just do that. Here we go. Okay. Does everybody see that? Okay. Great. Okay. I'm I'm really pleased to be here. When I was invited, I was asked specifically to talk about um, the work I've been doing on on caregiving networks. So that's what I'm presenting here. I do have other lines of work on dementia and. Uh, thinking broadly about families, and this, but this is a little bit different. This work is specific to personal, thinking about broader personal networks of caregivers, and it's work I'm doing in collaboration with some colleagues at the RAND Corporation, including an anthropologist who developed software for collecting network data. So uh, we've been working very closely to think about what you know, network should look like, what data we need, and have a whole bunch of information. So this work is still, even though it's several years underway, it's still preliminary because we've been spending a lot of time thinking about the best way to get these data together and think about networks as a, as a whole. Um, so just be warned <laughs> that this is still somewhat preliminary, uh, but I'll, I'll talk about some of the future directions as well. And, and again, uh, you know, as Amanda mentioned, this is work supported by, by an NIA grant. <clears throat> so as we all know, um, caring for family and friends places significant strain on a variety of outcomes, time, finances, health, and well-being. Uh, this affects you know, quality of life, well-being, and health outcomes of caregivers. And there's also evidence that the stress that caregivers face uh, can spill over onto the persons to whom they provide care and have adverse effects on their outcomes as well. The availability of support from family and friends serves as a buffer to this negative relationship between you know, stra caregiving stress and, and health and well-being. So social support is really important to think about when we're thinking about caregiver well-being. Um, it's especially salient for dementia care. Caregivers to people with dementia are more vulnerable than others to the adverse effects of caregiving. They tend to have worse outcomes. Um, they're also more dependent on support from family and friends for ensuring that dementia care needs are met. Um, the care for someone with dementia, you know, we talk about primary caregivers a lot. Usually it's a network of caregivers. Older adults with dementia have larger care networks than those without dementia. And even though about one in 10 older adults have dementia, uh, you know, based on those 2019 data, uh, they comprise about a third of family care hours provided. So a lot more networked care is happening with, when it comes to dementia. And you know, social support is also really important during times of crisis. I'm not going to talk a lot about the pandemic, but these data were collected several years ago, which, you know, is during the pandemic. So a lot of the talks you've probably been hearing are about 
uh, you know, pandemic related data. So I did want to say that even though I'm in this talk, I'm not going to talk about the effects of the pandemic or the direct effects of the pandemic. Um, we do know that support is even more has been even more important during times when there was reduced access to social ties during physical distancing um, and more salient for caregiving when there's loss of other other ties that the caregiver might have had outside of the home that might have provided support and other sources of care that the care recipient might have had access to. So I'm going to be thinking, talking a lot about social networks, these personal social networks, and personal networks are a way to provide access to support as well as other forms of social capital. So it's not only direct support from network members, but network members might have access to other important resources or information in times of need. Uh, caregiver networks um, include the focal caregiver. So I'll Sometimes we'll call them the ego or the caregiver, and then also the people they know, and those are the alters around them. And these alters who are part of the networks could be providing direct support to the caregiver. As I'll talk about a little later, we'll, we also find out whether they're providing care or support to the care recipient, which in a sense is indirect support to the caregiver by helping you know, provide for the care recipient. But the unique feature of networks as opposed to other measures of support is that we're also interested in people who aren't actively providing support at all. These are other people who might be mentioned as part of a network as close friends or as acquaintances who are potential support and could be called upon when needed. Um, and they also might affect the dynamics of the broader network. So we're interested in this complete network around the caregiver. There are several dimensions of networker of networks that may be related to caregiver well-being. Structure is a common one, and in fact, network size and density are two very important features of structure that tend to be associated with a whole variety of outcomes. That little figure on the side is actually from our data, and you know those those nodes, all those circles, are are alters around the caregiver and the care recipient. This network is one that's fairly large. There are a lot of network members. It's also pretty dense. So you can see a lot of the network members are near each other and connected to each other. Networks, not all networks look like this. <clears throat> some are smaller, some are, are more spread out with fewer connections between the nodes. And the two features that are important when we're thinking about caregiver well-being that I have listed here are the network size. The larger networks tend to be advantageous and that they provide more options when caregivers need support. There are more network members to turn to. Um, we sometimes talk about these networks as having bridging social capital, uh, so they can bridge across other networks or provide resources outside of the network. Uh, there's research on the strength of weak ties, having sort of these ties like those, there are a couple at the outskirts of that network in that picture there who might be connected to other important resources. And we do know already that when adults transition into caregiving roles, their network size tends to shrink. They lose some of their network members and that it could be negative for the mental health and well-being of caregivers. Another feature of network structure is density. As I mentioned before, highly dense or close-knit networks are beneficial in that they share information, they pool resources. And when it comes to caregiving, they can better coordinate support. They all know each other. They're all connected and talking to each other. So these networks are, are more bonded. They have a, a closeness and more bonding social capital in a way that less dense networks might not. Um, and there is some evidence from some of, some of my prior work with my uh, team of researchers that caregivers in denser networks were less likely to lose ties during the pandemic. Another feature of network structure is the composition of networks. So who's in the networks? And one characteristic that's been shown in the literature to potentially matter in this case when we're thinking about caregiving and caregiver outcomes is the percent of the network that is family. So, you know, networks can be made up of family, friends, you know, other relationships. And the degree to which a network contains family um, it could be good or it could be bad. It depends on whether those relationships are positive or negative. But in general, the literature suggests family members are more likely than non-kin to provide unconditional support when needed. Um, and dementia caregivers specifically report greater support from family than other social ties. Fin a final dimension to these networks is the function. You know, what does the network do? And that could be support diff of different types. It could also be strain and stress stemming from some of these relationships, which we're I'm not going to talk about here today. But one of the features that um, we're interested in, in particular when we think about 
these uh, caregiver networks is the extent to which there's care sharing. So for caregiving in particular, having more network members who are sharing in the care of the care recipient could help relieve the burden on caregivers and be beneficial for caregiver outcomes. So I have a few research questions I'll talk about today. First, what are common caregiver network typologies for caregivers to persons with dementia and other conditions? And you know, what are the common types? And then I'll also look at the profiles of caregivers in these different network types. So who are the caregivers in these different network types? And then the second set of analyses relate to the relationship between these network types and outcomes. And I'm going to look at well-being outcomes of caregivers and then also outcomes of care recipients, because as I mentioned, if the caregivers are supported and doing well, then care, the care recipients might be doing better as well. Um, and in all of these analyses, I know this is a dementia group, but I will be talking about results overall and then whether there are differences by dementia status, because sometimes there are and sometimes there aren't. So data and methods. Um, this is a new data collection effort that we began in 2020, which we've been calling the Caregiving Network Connections Over Time Study or the CONNECT study. And the data for the study come from um, the, the knowledge panel. I don't know if folks are familiar with that. It's a probability-based ongoing online US panel of, of you know 60,000, it's huge, of a lot of different members. Um, and it's weighted to represent the adult population 18 and over. They try and keep it representative by giving people, you know, laptop computers if they're low income and don't have computers and trying to kind of draw in a diverse population and then use weights to make sure that it's representative. What we did was draw a random sample of that population, um, screen them for whether they're caregivers, including oversampling dementia caregivers. And then that becomes the, the data that we're using, <clears throat> the basis for, for our survey. And we did this screening, the initial screening for caregivers in mid to late December of 2020, spilling a little bit into early January, 2021. So again, this is, this is the, you know, these data were collected at the height of the pandemic, the pre-vaccination period for the most part. And we screened for caregivers of different types, uh, focusing here on, on current caregivers. And then we asked a lot of different questions of these caregivers, including sociodemographic information about themselves and the person to whom they, were, they provide care, about caregiving contacts and the help provided, about different outcomes, a lot of caregiver outcomes, because again, the caregivers are the respondents, but a bit about the care recipient, unmet needs and outcomes as well. And then we got the network information about the caregiver networks. I'm only going to be focusing on that first wave of data today, the cross section, but our, our goal is to use data over time to look at changes over time. And we've already collected a second wave of interview data about a year later, and we're now in the field collecting a third wave of data in what we're going to consider the sort of post-pandemic post period. So we can look at changes during the pre-vaccination, post-vaccination, and then you know, the longer longer term. So, so stay tuned for, for longitudinal analyses, but for now, I'm going to stick with the cross-section. So there are a lot of ways to identify caregivers, think about who the caregivers are. Um, this is our screener. We asked, are you currently helping out or looking after a family member or friend 50 or older due to a chronic illness or disability? This may include help with tasks such as bathing, feeding, giving medicines, transportation, household chores, handling finances, or arranging for services. You do not necessarily need to live with them. And two things to note here. One is that we never use the word caregiver. So we don't want people who self-identify as caregivers. Everyone has a different concept of what it means to be a caregiver. We wanted to be able to identify people who are helping in some way. And our list of tasks, some are you know, more bathing, uh, more ADL associated. Some are IADLs like transportation. We were purposely keeping that broad as well so that we wouldn't only get the primary main caregiver. We wanna get any caregiver and then learn about the networks around these caregivers. And as I mentioned before, uh, you know, these are caregiver networks, but we're interested in the network around the care recipient as well, who's providing assistance to the care recipient, um, you know, as, you know, these are caregiver respondents. So to the extent that the caregiver can report on that. So we think of our network as the center is not just one ego, it's the caregiver and the care recipient, and they have network members all around them. Some are supporting both of them. Some may be supporting only one of them. 
And this combination of support can have implications for, for well-being. Okay, so this is how we get um, our list of network members. Again, we're not asking who's helping you at first. We want the full we want the full range of people who are in their lives. And we start out through a series of name generators trying to find out about all the people in the caregiver's life. So first we ask about uh, direct support. So we ask from time to time, most people discuss things that are important to them with others. For example, these may include good or bad things that happen to you, problems you're having, or important concerns you may have. Looking back over the 12 months, who are the people with whom you most often discuss things that were important to you? And we allow them to list up to 10 names. Now, other studies that have name generators keep it more limited to very close contacts, so only list a few names. As, you're, as you'll see, we have a lot of opportunities to list more and more names. So we do have some people listing you know, 20 or 30 names, others list fewer. So we're trying to get this broad picture of people's networks. After that name, name generator, we ask, are there any other peoples whom you have not yet mentioned, who provide you with any type of support or help in your life? Um, then we get up to five more names. Then we ask, are there any other people you haven't mentioned, such as members of your household who you did not mention already, or anyone else who's very important to you, perhaps someone you feel especially close? So that's another opportunity in case we miss someone in these other name generators. Just tell us about anyone we might have missed, another five people. And then we ask about the care recipient because we are interested in the networks to the supporting the care recipient as well. Um, so then we say, you know, please think of people who are close to, you know, the care recipient, um, even if they're not people you know or, for, or feel particularly close to yourself. Is there anyone you haven't already listed who is close or provides unpaid care to the care recipient? Um, so the goal is to get as many names as possible and really identify the full, you know, all the alters, the full network around the caregiver. Once we have this list of alters, we ask about information about everyone named. We have some basic sociodemographic information that I don't have listed here, and then we ask about support. So we find out from everyone wh whether they're providing different types of support to the caregiver, whether they're providing different types of support to the care recipient. And again, this isn't specific to what name generator they came in through. It could, it could have been someone that the caregiver said was a good friend of theirs and didn't necessarily list you know, later. We're still asking about support to the caregiver, to the care recipient. And then we ask about connections. How connected are people to each other? As I mentioned before, density is a very important feature of these networks as well. So we want to know if they know each other and whether they have regular contact. We use this information to get several measures of networks. These are the ones I'll be talking about here today. There's actually a, a lot of other measures that we can get and we've looked at and considered. And, and these, these were the ones that um, were most useful for identifying our network typologies that I'll talk about in a bit. So in terms of structure, we're thinking about network size, the number of distinct alters named by the respondent. Density is the number of alter pairs who have regular contact divided by the total number of pairs. The composition, as I mentioned before, where is proportion, we're interested in the proportion of kin, so the percent of family members in a network. And then we're also thinking a lot about care sharing, so the percent of alters who provide support to the care recipient, even though this is our caregiver networks. I'm gonna talk about four different measures of caregiver well-being. These are our caregiver outcomes. Uh, the first is anxiety. That's measures on a five item subscale of the mental health inventory and asks about anxiety symptoms in the past month. Depressive symptomology is an eight item version of the patient health questionnaire and is a clini clinically validated measure of depressive symptoms based on the DSM-4 criteria for depressive disorders. We also look at hopelessness based on uh, this brief you know, hopelessness scale. Um, it asks for agreement with the following questions. The future seems to me to be hopeful, and I believe that things are changing for the better in my life, and I feel that it's possible to reach goals I'm striving for. Uh, and then we have a three-item short-scale measuring loneliness, and that is blocked a little on my screen, but it asks about being isolated or left out. I can't see uh, the wording that I have right there. We also are looking at three measures of care recipient outcomes. Again, these are reported. It's important to mention these are reported by the caregiver. This is a caregiver study. But the care, we asked the caregiver whether in the last month the care recipient uh, needed help and no one was there to help them with things like, and, and because of that, they had unmet needs. So they had to stay in bed. 
They went without clean laundry. They went without groceries, went without their bills or banking matters taken care of, went without eating, went without bathing, accidentally wet or soiled their clothes, made a mistake in taking their prescribed medicines or missed a medical appointment. <clears throat> and I'll be talking about um, any, whether someone has at least one of these unmet needs as our outcome today. Then we also look at whether the care recipient had any falls in the last 12 months and any hospitalization. So in terms of dementia status, we have a very broad way we've been thinking about dementia. We have a couple of places where the caregiver might report that they're caring for someone with dementia. We have a list, um, we have some information about diagnosis. So if they report that they're caring someone with a dementia diagnosis, then we consider them a caregiver to someone with dementia, but not everybody is diagnosed with dementia. So we also do ask for reasons why they're providing care. And if they state that it's due, we have a long list. And if they mark off that it's due to a memory problem or due to dementia or, or other related factors, then we consider this a caregiver to someone with dementia. Uh, in terms of our model covariates, we have a bunch of other measures of the, the usual, uh, socio-demographic suspects, so some caregiver characteristics, age, gender, you know, racial and ethnic categories, whether they have children in the home, uh, education, which is categorized as BA, bachelor's degree or higher, income category. We have some care recipient characteristics that we, I'll be showing you in a bit that we also include in our models. And then we're also interested in the relationship to the caregiver, whether it's a parent, spouse, an other relative or a non-relative. So we have pretty much basically two sets of analyses that I'll talk about today. The first is the latent profile analysis to identify the sort of common network types. And we use this LPA to estimate the probability of profile membership based on observed indicators. And those indicators I've mentioned before are network size, density, kin composition, and care sharing. What we ended up with out of the LPA is a three pro profile solution that seem to fit the data best and have meaningful results. So we ended up with three different caregiver types that I'll talk about here today. We tried including other measures, looking at other profiles, but in the end, these seem to fit the data best without really small cell sizes that are hard to analyze and hard to interpret. Then I'll talk about results of regression models to examine the associations between these profiles from the LPA and our uh, well-being outcomes for caregivers and care recipients. And these, and these models include, adjust, we adjust for a whole bunch of factors, age, race, gender, education, income, dementia status, and caregiver relationship, and you know having young children in the home. Um, and then it also adjusts for the uncertainty in the profile assignment. So this is done in R, and it'll automatically adjust for you know the uncertainty around the LPA results. I did want to note that our LPA models are weighted, but for some reason, the regression models, the weights, um, they don't seem to be using the weights. This is something we're still looking into, as I mentioned. Some of this is still a little bit preliminary. Uh, so that's something that we're still working on to see whether it makes a difference if the regression models are weighted or unweighted. Okay, in terms of the results. So this is what caregivers in our study look like in the first year of COVID. Um, and, you know, again, these are caregivers very broadly defined. The average age of our caregivers is almost 50, and our care recipients are about 74. About 57% of our caregivers are female, 58% are white, 28% have ch young children living in the home, 27% um, have a bachelor's degree, and 38% are low income. These caregivers are primarily caring, ch adult children caring for a parent, that's more than half of our sample, but we do have people caring for spouses, other relatives, and even a fair amount providing care to a non-relative, which we were happy to see. We wanted this diversity in these caregivers. About 20% are providing care for someone with dementia, and, and people are providing a fair amount of care overall about, you know, more than, we have 31% providing more than 20 hours of care weekly. Uh, in terms of our outcomes, you know, we have, uh, you know, you can see our means on our anxiety, depression, hopelessness, and loneliness outcomes for the caregivers. And then for the care recipients, we have a fair amount that have unmet needs or falls um, and even overnight hospital stays. So, you know, more than half are experiencing unmet needs or falls and, you know, 40% had an overnight hospital stay in the past year. <clears throat> 
All right, so now I want to turn to the results of the network typologies. So here, let's see if I can talk through the, the figure. We have um, on the y-axis, we have those network measures that I discussed before. So, that, so up at the top, we have the number of alters. That's the size of the networks. Then we have density, percent kin, um, and the per percent providing support to care recipients. And these are our three network types that were identified from the LPA. The red, we're calling close-knit kin. Uh, green are small and low care sharing, and blue are large and high care sharing. And if you look at the figure or you know the sidebar there where I've summarized some things, uh, these close-knit kin networks, they make up more than half of these network types. They're pretty average in size relative to the other network types, but they're they're higher in density. So you can see um, they're a little bit higher than the others in terms of density. They also tend to have more kin and they have higher care sharing. So we're calling them our close-knit kin group because they are the high proportion kin, but they also have other, other characteristics that make them different from those other groups. The second group we're calling the small and low care sharing network. That was about a quarter of our networks. These are small in size. If you look back at that number of alters, the green, there are smaller size networks and they provide less support to the care recipient. If you look down at that bottom, they're very far from the others, so much less support. Our blue bars are the large and high care sharing networks, so make up about 22% of our networks. These are the biggest, the largest size networks, and they have a lot of care sharing for the care recipient. And then in terms of other characteristics, um, like density and proportion kin, they're actually very similar to our small and low care sharing group, a little bit different than the close-knit kin group. I know there's a lot. This is a, a big table, um, but I'm hoping the color coding helps a bit. I'll talk through this in a second. These are some of the characteristics that we looked at to see who ends up in these three different types. So, you know, it's not equal representation across these caregiving types. We have different types of caregivers with different profiles who end up in these, these three groups. We looked at race, education, income, and relationship to caregiver. Those were statistically significant and that's why those are displayed there. But we also looked at gender, age, whether there are children in the household, and dementia status and did not see differences across the group. So I, I did want to point out that we did, you know, even though some there's some evidence that dementia caregivers have these bigger networks, have different networks, we weren't seeing that here with our LPA, or at least not significant differences. But what we are seeing is that our close-knit kin group, uh, that, that, you know, the first column under our network profiles, they are more likely than some of the other groups to be white, especially more likely than the large and high care sharing group to be white. They tend to be more educated and have higher incomes. So a little bit more advantaged in terms of, of SES. So, you know, it's a close knit small group that we're seeing is more advantaged, at least in terms of their demographic characteristics. If we turn to that larger and high care sharing column, that group um, is a little more likely and significantly so to be black than the other groups and lower income. So you can think about that group as the sort of more disadvantaged in terms of socioeconomics and, um, and more likely to be a ra racial and ethnic minority. Our middle group there, the small and low care sharing group, bounces around a bit in terms of who, you know, who they're most similar to and other characteristics. But a really important feature is that tends to be, it's much more likely than the other groups to be non-kin. So, you know, I think these are important differences between these groups that we adjust for in the models that you'll see soon, but even just thinking about, you know, what kinds of groups, what kinds of profiles um, different caregivers have and where there are differences is, is really important for when we think about these different typologies. So now I'm gonna turn to the association between these typologies and outcomes, first starting with the caregiver well-being outcomes and then turning to care recipient outcomes.
So what I have displayed here are our four caregiver well-being outcomes, anxiety, depression, hopelessness, and loneliness. And those three different network types are the, the bars that you see. The blue is the small and low care sharing. Purple is the close-knit kin. And green are the large and high care sharing groups. And these are standardized. I'm, I'm reporting standardized Z-scores across these outcomes. So you, you could compare them across, across these outcomes. They're standardized at their means. And I think one thing you can see before we get into the nitty gritty, you know, weedy details is that ign ignoring hopelessness for a minute, anxiety, depression, loneliness, you're seeing, there's, we're seeing pretty similar patterns across these different network types. So the blue bars, the small and low care sharing have highest levels of anxiety, hopelessness, and loneliness. So that's, you know, worse outcomes, more is, is worse. Then they're followed by close knit kin and the large and high care sharing group uh, you know, is, seems to be the most, do the best in terms of these outcomes, least likely to have these adverse outcomes. And we're actually seeing significant differences for the most part between the small and low care sharing group and the large and high care sharing group, at least for the anxiety, loneliness, and depression. In addition for depression, the close-knit kin group reports significantly worse well-being than, than large and high care sharing groups. So we're seeing even another significant difference there between those other two groups. Um, we're not seeing any significant differences when it comes to hopelessness. So next we're interested in thinking about variation by dementia status. And what I have, what I show here are similar figures to what you saw before, but broken down um, by, for dementia caregivers compared to other caregivers. And it's a little hard to see, but the, there's a dashed lighter colored bar that represents the other caregivers and the filled in bars, the dementia caregivers. And we have some small asterisks underneath the ones where we see significant differences between dementia and other caregivers. So I have, there, there are four figures here for the hopelessness, loneliness, depression, and anxiety outcomes. And one thing that stands out here, and I've kind of circled it so it would stand out more um, in these slides, is that the purple bars, that close-knit kin group, is where we're seeing differences between the dementia caregivers and other caregivers across all four outcomes. So even hopelessness, where we didn't see much before, we're seeing a difference here. Um, and what we're seeing is that dementia caregivers have worse out, significantly worse outcomes than do other caregivers across all four of these. But this is mainly within the close-knit kin group. So we're not seeing these differences at all in the large and high care sharing group. And we're only seeing it for loneliness in the small and low care sharing group. So there's something something significant here about being in that close-knit kin group um, for dementia compared to other caregivers. And, and the outcomes are worse for dementia caregivers when they are in this group. All right, so now I'm gonna turn to the associations um, between these network types and care recipient well-being outcomes. And I'm gonna go through these pretty quickly because there's really not much here. We looked at unmet needs, faults, hospitalizations, and you don't need us, you don't need to do too much testing to see that these are very, very similar across groups. So the network type doesn't matter very much for these care recipient outcomes. And let me show you the next slide. Here you see some differences in the bars. Uh, dementia seems to be worse for dementia carers than others at least in terms of unmet needs and falls, but it's true for all the different types. So it doesn't really matter. We don't see differences across these different network types, whether someone's in a small low care sharing group, the close knit kin group or the large and high caring sharing group, it's worse to be a dementia caregiver than other caregiver or more likely to have you know, unmet needs or falls or you know, adverse um, outcomes for the care recipient, but there's no real difference across these groups. I'm going to take a little bit of time now for discussion and implications and then turn to questions. We should have plenty of time for questions. Um, so just to summarize some of the findings here, we identified three personal network types of caregivers. We have a close-knit kin network that consists mostly of family members, large networks that share caregiving activities but are composed of relatively few kin small networks um, with less assistance with, with caregiving. 
And different kinds of caregivers fall into these different groups. So the socio-demographically advantaged groups are more likely to be in that close-knit kin group, racial minorities, and lower income caregivers seem to rely on larger, larger networks where there's more sharing of caregiving responsibilities. The type of caregiver network does seem to have some implications for the well-being of caregivers. In general, large networks with more of this bridging capital, more support for the care recipient are associated with better outcomes than the small and low care sharing networks. Um, but we're not really seeing differences when we think about you know, the care recipient outcomes. And I did want to note, you know, not only because I'm talking to this dementia <laughs> group of scholars, but we are seeing something here for the dementia caregivers. And this may be a distinctive group um, among those who are in these more close-knit kin networks in particular, outcomes are worse for someone with dementia than caregivers some with other conditions. And we're not seeing that to the same extent across the other, the other groups. So there is something significant to this close-knit kin group potentially in terms of how well dementia caregivers do. And there is some literature out there suggesting that, I know I'd said before, can kins provide more emotional support, more unconditional support. There's literature on that, but there's also literature on the stress. There's, there's stress and strain from family relationships and you can't avoid family. So if it's a stressful relationship, you might be stuck with it. Um, this has been referred to as the dark side of social capital. Sometimes having more social relationships, if they're not the right types of relationships or not positive relationships can actually be negative and lead to adverse health outcomes. And um, my colleagues and I are actually, you know, we, we've submitted a proposal to do an intervention. So there's some work thinking about different interventions to restructure networks to help promote caregiver well-being, either by drawing in network members who aren't being fully utilized or thinking about network members that are positive and those that are negative and how to restructure these relationships. So there does seem to be some potential here for dementia caregivers, especially in certain types of, of networks to think about how they can make their networks you know, better, work better for them. I want to acknowledge um, several limitations to the study. Again, this is work in progress, so maybe some of these we can address, some of these we can't, but we do capture these networks of caregivers during the height of the pandemic. This might not be typical of other times, but it does give us insight into the importance of network structure during a crisis. And we will, you know, we do have plans to look at this after, you know, those future waves to see whether we see the same story uh, in the sort of I don't know if we could call it post-pandemic times yet, but uh, post-vaccination and then, you know, the sort of mo moving toward stability times. Also, networks aren't static. We're capturing these at one time point, which might not capture the full effect of the caregiver network experience. We do plan to examine that with future waves of the study. These networks are self-reported by the caregiver. We have one primary respondent. There is other work on networks that you know, collects information from everybody. And in some ways, that's the gold standard to get in, you know, information on everybody's, every, all the caregivers' networks and, and compile it. That is really difficult to do when you're outside of a smaller community-based setting. And you know, we're trying to get population representative estimates so that's not something that we can necessarily do, but we have the advantage of getting these broader networks. Um, and even though what we're thinking about are networks as perceived by the caregiver, these perceptions might be just as important for their perceptions of well-being, which is what we're examining here. And we do have limited measures of the care recipient well-being and outcomes because we're talking, speaking to the caregiver. There are only certain things we feel comfortable asking them about. We can't ask them for a slew of health information. So that might be why we're not seeing as much for the care recipient outcomes. Okay, so finally, just to wrap up, um, some of our next steps. I, I did want to mention this trade-off between the LPA models versus looking at individual network components um, or thinking about it some other way. You know, the nice thing about these network typologies, which is why I'm showing them here and we've been using them in some of our analyses, is that we can pull together different factors and really identify these different groups. So, you know, sometimes the size of networks and density, you know, might go hand in hand. These smaller networks tend to be more dense. It's odd to look at all these pieces separately when they really do, you know, hang together in different ways. And this does help us have a more par parsimonious way of organizing the network data and thinking about these groups. On the other hand, it means we can't include 
everything. If we start throwing in too much network information, as we did initially, then you um, end up with models that go, don't converge. You end up with some really small small cells that for a very small percent of the population that is not is not interpretable. Um, so some of the things we're still thinking about are other methods where we can bring in more information but still account for these complex interactions across the network components. Another next step is to do some more work on the caregiver outcomes. We have more on caregivers that I haven't looked at here today. So we could look more explicitly at health and health conditions, um, at burden. We ask about several different types of burden. And we have limited care recipient outcomes. We have a few more things we could potentially look at, um, but we can also, we're also thinking about breaking apart some of the unmet needs, just thinking about um, grouping some of these out outcomes differently to try to really pinpoint the most disadvantaged care recipients. And then I did want to just mention that, you know, I didn't really talk about sort of the theoretical perspectives underlying this work, um, but there's a literature on, on linked lives that thinks about these connections across members, including caregivers or the caregiver and the care recipients and, and over time. And we've been thinking as well about these connections between caregiver and care recipient. That's why we're including information on the percent of care sharing, but there's other ways we can think about an, in the network context, the linkages between the caregiver and care recipients. Um, so, you know, the number of supportive of shared ties, for instance, between the two of them, and then looking at what happens if you know, the caregiver is no longer providing support later, which is one of our interests as we track caregivers over time. If, if there are more of these shared ties, do they lose these ties as they progress over time? Um, and you know, what happens how, to what extent as, after these lives are, are, not, are not linked in the same way? How does that alter networks? And then even more generally, we, have, we do have longitudinal data. We're about to have the third wave of data. So our plans are to look at changes you know, pre-COVID, post-COVID and over the longer run. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, and I look forward to, I left, I think I left enough time. You said to leave some time for questions. So <laughs> hope that's plenty of time for questions and discussion. And this is work in progress. So the discussion, you know, helps me as well. Should I stop sharing my screen so people can see me? What would you prefer? Sure. Although there may be, I, there could we'll be. Go back to slides. Okay. Yeah, I never know what. Slide. It's hard to say. Yeah. Thank you so much, Esther. I see already Irving has his hand up. Take us away, Irving. Thank you, Esther. Great presentation. I, I, these kind of studies are really interesting, and and the data makes sense in terms of the keen and close and the financial and all those aspects. I wanted to ask you, um, in and you alluded a little bit on on your latest uh, slides, the context where these caregivers are. Do you have an N of two? 2000 over do do they are in a more metropolitan area do, do you see any differences based on on the region where the caregivers are whether they're you can correlate with resources you know more about the mm -hmm. context where the caregivers are and whether that has an impact and and on their outcomes well, and network uh, yeah. Yeah, that's a great a great point, and we do know about um, the state and then you know geographic region broadly. We have that information. We started looking at some of that mostly in the context of of COVID. So we were interested in COVID related policies at, that might have fostered more more or less distancing, and um, and we weren't really seeing that much. But you're right; we probably should throw that into these models as well and just think about, you know, whether, you know, yeah, being in a more metropolitan area might make a difference for how large the networks might be. And I, I suspect it, it it might. So that's a great point. And I'll, I'll, I'll add that to our next steps. Thank you. I was wondering, Esther, about the COVID piece. Was there a time frame placed on the questions that people were being asked? Like, were they asked currently, like today or this month or this year, um, or were they just being generally asked? I, I'm wondering, especially in that early pandemic timeframe, how much people were thinking in the pandemic versus their life prior to the pandemic. Yeah, you know, I didn't show this because it's a different, <laughs> a different set of papers that we've been working on. In fact, we started focusing in on the pandemic and changes to networks during the pandemic. But we had actually asked people, 
I, I wonder if, oh, I don't know if I'll be able to find it quickly. Um, I think I have a few, if we had some additional screener questions. So we asked people to tell us, uh, we were interested in identifying different types of caregivers. So people who are, you know, currently caregivers stop providing care because of the, due to the pandemic and, you know, and then people who are new caregivers due to the pandemic. So we had used as a time frame, we used the March, that sort of March 2020 date, which we said was, you know, considered by some as the start of the pandemic, you know, I mean, people have their own definitions, but we, we kind of defined it and said, thinking back to that time, specifically to March 2020, you know, did you stop being a caregiver? And then was it because of the pandemic as well? And then we got some, some explanations for why people stopped um, so that we know if they were, were a caregiver or no longer a caregiver. And we do follow up with some of them to see if they become caregivers again, but we haven't quite sifted through all those data yet. Um, but then we also ask, when we ask about networks, we, I didn't show these, but we have two other questions that we ask after we ask all of these different questions to get our list of altered, the name generators. We do also ask about people who provided help before the pandemic, again, using that March 2020. So, so we not only, you know, have, we find out about these caregivers, our main respondents, whether they were providing care before and continued or didn't. We also, when we get the network information for people who are active caregivers, we ask if there are other people in the network who were providing assistance before the pandemic and stopped. Um, and that's one of the things we've been looking at, like who are these people who stopped providing care? And, that, and I think I'd mentioned that we did find the network characteristics matter. So these more dense networks where there's more connections between people, fewer people were, were lost um, or left you know, during, during the pandemic than ones where they were sort of actually usually larger, but larger and less dense networks where they'd lost more of their um, but you know, network members and potential, you know, caregivers and supporters. So yeah, so this is another feature of the the study that I didn't talk about here today, but definitely yeah, something we've, really we've been cool. we've been looking into. Yeah. And I could ask another question too, but I want um, please sure. feel free to either. And I guess I can add that uh, you know yeah. one of the this mm -hmm. we didn't this wasn't supposed to be a COVID study, right? We got the grant, <laughs> we had a, we were ready to go out into the field, and then COVID hit. Um, it was always going to be an online study, but our questions made no sense once COVID struck. So that was why we had to start putting in more information about, well, thinking back to this time frame, and the, you know, we had to put it in the context of COVID because there was no other way for, to think about. We didn't want people coming and saying, oh, nobody's helping me now because it's COVID. So <laughs> we had to gather all of that information. And I think in some ways, it, it, you know, we were able to get retrospective information, which is nice, and we're using it in some of our studies. It would have been even better if we had collected the data, you know, pre and post the beginning of COVID. We, you know, it's just timing. It was the way it worked out. But there are other studies like the PSID to put a plug in there, but somewhere they were already collecting data in the before times. And, you know, and NHATS has some great questions about the pandemic where you actually, you know, could look at people's, you know, what it looked like before and what it looked like after. And, and we're just trying to extend it beyond. So we have sort of retrospective information pre-March 2020, then we have the actual reports of networks and we're continuing on into the future from there. So sorry, and yes, you go ahead with your, your next question. <laughs> well, and I wanna encourage others to feel free to either raise your hand like Irving did or just unmute and, and pop in. So I can tell you from doing very similar work as we've discussed in NHATS and NSOC, we're seeing very, very complimentary results. Like our clusters are similar, our associations are quite similar. So I think it's kind of encouraging that in different data sources, different measures, different definitions, we're still seeing um, pretty complementary things. One distinction in our data, we saw um, a bigger proportion of the sample in the like larger networks actually than you were seeing. So that's maybe one distinction. But um, one thing I was curious about too, is it seems like you were just asking this panel, right, whether somebody, you weren't using the word caregiving, but whether someone was providing assistance, et, et mm -hmm. cetera, with your definition, but you weren't using per se the primary caregiver definition, right? And yet your sample looks like a pretty standard caregiving sample. So I found that mm -hmm. interesting, but I was wondering, you know, um, for someone who wasn't a spouse or was an adult child, do you think they have the, a full sense of who is assisting? You know, I'm just, and this is hypothetical, but 
I'm curious whether the different perspectives of the different relationships, some more traditional caregivers, some less tr traditional caregivers, were you seeing any distinctions in the reports between the type of care provider that was your ego? Yeah, or is there a, a way to look at that? I don't know. I don't know how, I mean, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm trying to think about that. It, it, it's a good point. And that's why I always acknowledge that these are the perceived uh, networks by the caregiver. We did purposely, we didn't want this to be only primary caregivers. And actually um, we did look at, we do know if they're the primary caregiver, be, uh, we didn't ask them that question, but because we have information on who in the network is assisting, we we know if they're, we did ask if they're providing more help than others in the network or if it's shared in the network and some other questions along the way, others provide more than they do. So using that information, we can identify whether someone's a primary caregiver. And I'm trying to remember now, you know, I had that in an earlier set of slides, but I, it was may, maybe half or a little less than half were actually primary caregivers. So we have a lot of people who say that others are providing more assistance, others in the network, or that it's equally shared by everyone. So they're not, there is no primary caregiver. And I hope I'm not getting that uh, statistic wrong, uh, but I have to double check. But um, but we did have some variation there. And so it wasn't like everybody was actually a primary caregiver. They just happened to not be family, uh, you know, and, and I'm sure that's correlated with other characteristics of the caregivers. It's challenging, though. I'm trying to think about your question of, you know, how accurate, you know, these reports are. These are all perceptions. So, it, you know, it's hard to say who knows better. I, I mean, I would suspect that a spouse, you know, might know more than a child and a child might might know more than a neighbor, but we don't really know. And, and, and or maybe it's related to how many hours of help they're providing and not so much the relationships or some interaction. Uh, you know, this could be something maybe to examine in other work where you have perceptions and actual information. Um, the other thing that's interesting is there's a lot of work on even caregivers and care recipients have different perceptions of networks. So the care recipients will say, you know, here are how many people are helping me. And then the caregivers will say here, you know, no, there's more people helping, you know, them. Often the caregivers report more, more assistance than the caregiver, you know, reports because they have different definitions of what's happening. So I, so the answer is, is yes, <laughs> that there'd be differences, but it's, it's really difficult to know which is the kind of more objective measure. And um, for certain kinds of outcomes, it's, it's not even about the objective measure. It is about perceptions of support, I think. Does that answer? That definitely. The yeah, okay. it's complicated. But right? it's really complicated, but really that's interesting. Why there's multiple but, of us doing this. Yeah. but I think you need another, we need a study where we get both, where we get, yeah. you know, the per perceived from, from different vantage points. Um, and I don't know, you know, I'm not sure what's objective, but maybe get <laughs> get reports mm -hmm. from someone, someone in the home, um, which maybe is, is a little closer. Although again, even spouses have different reports mm -hmm. of these networks. Definitely. Yeah. And it's just interesting to see so many networks kind of being led by non-spouses, non-adult child caregivers. I'm interested in that too. But um, anyone yeah, else? Yeah, and we have a fair amount of those. That is something yeah. that we could break down and examine separately in these data. And it did it did matter for the network type. There was a you know a network type where we have a lot of non-kin, so right. you know, that mm -hmm. makes a difference. Yep. Likewise, we're seeing that too. That's great. Else? I love this. I love the complementarities across these yeah. different studies, <laughs> with different data. We have about six minutes. Yeah, I, I have a question. Um, hi, uh, thank oh, you. Hi, for, well. <laughs> yeah, surprise. Um, thanks for an engaging talk. Um, I was thinking about, from the perspective of my own interest in this topic, um, the role of professionals in these caregiver networks. So, for example, a, a home health aide or a neurologist or different types of nurses. And I wonder a couple of questions. First, are the, would they show up in your name generators? I was thinking about this because uh, some of the name generators, it, it wasn't quite a fit. Where where would a home health aid pop up? And then I was wondering if you if you collected information on that for the alters who were named, were you able to look at like professional composition or whether or not professionals were present? Uh, because that seems like another way to differentiate these networks potentially. Yes. So I'm glad you brought that up. That and that's actually something we've been thinking a lot about for you know future future steps. Um, there's two answers <laughs> to that. The first, we, we this is you know the way we set up these networks, we design them to be um, you know family friend unpaid caregivers, and our our questions do ask it that way. That said, 
we did get some information on professionals because we did ask you know re about relationships and who these people are and sometimes there's an other and the other would be a nurse but they would list them some as a, as a as a supporter as somebody who provides support um in the final name gen most of the name generators were just you know who are people you talk to every day about important matters or you know who do you feel close to and people sometimes reported you know so, like a, a direct care worker who's in the home as someone they talk to and someone they feel close to um which we weren't we weren't really thinking about and, and and it would be wrong to exclude them because these are people who they talk to about important things who are part of their networks. This wasn't common, but we did sometimes get get them. Um, our name generator, we asked about help to the care recipient. We were very explicit and said it should only be unpaid help. So we got fewer, fewer of them there. So they're actually popping up as just sort of the people that, we, that are part of my, our, my everyday network, that they might list somebody with these relationships. And we only knew about it because we had an, you know, kind of other category so we sometimes sometimes they'd fill it in and tell us, but not enough to really know for sure, you know, who, who's in the network, or how many are in the network. We did have a separate question just asking about, uh, you know, kind of number of, you know, paid helpers. I have, I should say that in this COVID wave, there was a problem with the skip pattern. So um, trying to remember, I think we, we got it for people who are non-spout. We got it for almost everyone, but not everyone. So that was why I didn't include it in these models. That was fixed in the in the future waves um so that's that's why that's not in a model as a covariate but you know but but all we got we didn't get networks of paid help it was it was just one you know one question and i i think it's be really interesting to think about this the intersection between you know this you know unpaid um so social support and then these paid networks uh you know this is more of a traditional i'd say more traditional like analysis of the kind of network of supports asking questions about you know who do you talk to about important things who's there to help you a little less about the care right now but uh, that's definitely a, a big part of the networks and and you can see it from the fact that some people are mentioning it as oh this is my these are my friends these are my supporters the people who are are helping with care so yeah thanks for bringing that up i should have i should have mentioned that it's a really interesting point Thank you. Any final thoughts from the group? All right. With that, I think we can wrap up. Stephanie, any final comments on your end? Um, yeah, I will be sending out um, the event evaluation. Um, I did put it in the chat if you want to fill it out now, but I'll be sending one along um, in a little bit on later today. Uh, please fill it out. We really do value your opinions on these. We want to keep them going and um, see what topics you're interested in in the future. Thank you so much, Thanks, Esther. Right. So Thank you so much for having me. And, and I really enjoyed the Thank discussion you. and it'll make this work even better. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.